language screening data, which um, Jen just talked about. Um, I go to all the data meetings with all of these grade levels so that we can talk with the teachers, um, analyze the data, um, figure out who we believe needs more help who is, are not already getting services. Um, and from there, the students that we flagged, I take um, and I administer the gates McGinnity reading test to gather more information about their reading. Um, they qualify for Title I if they score below the 40 NCE, which is the normal cor curve equivalent. Um, we also consider their reading level. Their, the, I can administer the DRA for them um, so that I can really pinpoint what their reading level is. And if they're six months below grade level or more, um, that definitely qualifies them. Um, and of course, um, I'm in constant communication with the teachers, with the families. It's really a team effort. Sorry, I knew my cat was going to jump on here. <laughs> um, I'm in constant communication with the teachers and the families um, to make sure that, you know, throughout the year we're checking in and if anybody is falling behind in any of these ways that I can administer the gates to them, um, make sure everybody's getting what they need. Um, and um, we're always, you know, communicating and ready to help anybody that we can. Um, so yeah, we have just the kind of a brief overview of some of the big data points from the past year. Um, this is the first grade data. Um, this shows the data of the early reading growth that just assesses their, their understanding of concepts of print, their phonological awareness and their decoding skills. Um, our grade two data, um, this was two assessments and showing here. Um, the CBMR is a big one um, that basically assesses their fluency. Um, and their accuracy in their reading. Um, and then the A reading, which assesses their phonics and comprehension skills. And then below I have um, the DRA levels, which students made a, a full year's worth growth. Um, our grade three data, we had 10 students in this group. Um, I have the, the CBMR again and the um, A reading, which in these higher grades assesses their vocabulary and their comprehension skills. And then 40% of these um, students made a year's worth of growth on their DRA levels. Um, fourth grade, we had two students in this, 100%, um, both of them <laughs> made a year's worth of growth on their DRA levels. And I have the CBMR and A reading data once again. Fifth grade, we had six students in this group. Same assessments are up here for the upper grades. 50% of them made a year's worth of growth. And then sixth grade, we had our four students. 25% um, of them made a year's worth of growth. Um, and then also the CBMR and the A reading data. Um, so for the, the next steps that we have with this, um, it was a, a big learning year for me. Um, I'm very, very lucky that the district um, has sent me to, to be trained in Orton-Gillingham, which has just been a wealth of knowledge. Um, and I'm now fully implementing it into all my first grade through fourth grade groups this year. Um, we have our new program Wonders that I'm implementing with the fifth and sixth grade that is already off to an awesome start, um, working really, really closely with the teachers. Um, we're going to continue the weekly progress monitoring um, with the fast bridge, and then we still do our screenings three times a year. Um, I also attended a training for the science of reading with the Hill for Literacy, which I am also implementing those strategies this year. So I'm really looking forward to a, a very um, successful year with these, these very hardworking kids and um, getting to um, identify even more kids that I can help. Um, and I think that we're off to a good start so far. I think we are, and to, to also add on to next steps, we of course wanna incorporate more parent communication and family engagement. So that's a big thing that um, Ms. Fernandes and I are gonna be working on with our first um, touching base with families on September 29th during our open house. Uh, Mrs. Fernandes will be available to speak with some families. Um, and then going forward, we had wonderful literacy nights um, that kind of took a back seat due to COVID. So we definitely, we tried Zoom and we, we've done a whole host of other things, but it will be really wonderful to be able to get another literacy night to just encourage families to come and talk to us and, and offer um, materials and information for students so that, you know, it, 
reading is a team effort. It's not just one person in one place. It really is um, making sure that we're all working together in the best interests of the students. So I would really love to say thank you to Mrs. Fernandes, who's been a wonderful, wonderful addition to our school community. Um, and although she started last year, it feels like she's been here for a really long time. And I know the students really benefit from her warmth and um, her knowledge and the fact that she wanted to go and be able to be trained in a systematic reading um, intervention that shows wonderful, wonderful growth for students. Um, it's not easy to get trained in Norton Gillingham. I know I've been trained myself as a special education teacher. It requires a lot of work. And so to be able to have that skill set available in the building for our Title I students is just going to be a wonderful addition. And that's all we really have from last year. If anybody has any questions, we'd love to answer them together. Thank you, Ms. Dowd and um, Ms. Fernandez. Appreciate the presentation. Um, let's open it up to questions and comments from the school committee. Hey, this is this is Paul. Thanks for the information. Just a just a general question. What are your key lessons? What are the, what's been the pinch points? What, what is the hardest thing to overcome? And uh, you know, what are the best, best things you've learned? Hi, Paul, nice to meet you. Yeah. Um, I definitely, I mean, the Orton Gillingham training has opened me up to just how important it is to have that systematic um, practice that you're, that you're providing to your students. Um, I've definitely learned a lot you know, relying on my assessments to inform all of my instruction. Um, I think that with all of that put together, it's going to be a successful year for the students. And we started full fledged today was the first day with the groups um, going gung ho on Orton Gillingham and they're loving it already, which is great. Um, and I think that um, it also instills that love for reading in them that, um, you know, they're excited that they're feeling successful. Um, and I'm excited to keep doing that all year. Thanks. I don't have any questions, but um, I would just like to say that this role is so vital in the schools and your, your role is so important and it takes children who are so frustrated and, and don't like reading and a lot of them come out loving reading. And so it's just a fantastic thing to see. I love seeing the data um, from this. Um, and embarrassingly so, um, I'm glad to be able to put a name to your face because I see you, at, or I used to see you um, at pickup all the time and you were always a nice smiling face for all the parents and you wave to everybody and so sweet. So, um, you know, I'm glad to be able to put that um, name to the face for you and congratulations. Thank you. And it's nice to see you again too. <laughs> Christine. Hi, uh, Christine Pripchinski, and my son actually benefited from Title I years ago, so I'm a huge proponent. Um, my, I'm just wondering, did the numbers uh, really jump up after COVID in terms of the amount of students who needed services? We did have a lot join the groups um, after COVID. I wasn't at the school before, but I, I can say that um, our first grade groups were big last year, very big. And we have a great team that we worked really, really hard to get a lot of kids, you know, the amount of services that we need um, this year. It's feeling like a more manageable number um, because a lot um, I, I think that there definitely was a lot of kids that joined Title. Um, but it was a great opportunity to be able to help them go to exactly where they needed to be and, and give them exactly what they needed. Oh, that's great. I'd just like to thank both of you. Excellent job. Thank you so much. Thank you for all of the hard work that you do. And for the school committee, you typically do get an update on Title I and the outcomes for Title I. And the theme that you'll be hearing tonight, even also when you hear from Michelle, and just a tiny bit on Title III, is that if we're doing our job well, 
the school committee, all of us should be able to point to the systems and processes that we have in place in order to very quickly identify children who will benefit from supplemental evidence-based instruction. And we should be able to say to you, this is a system we have for identifying those children. This is how we know who needs extra help. This is a regular way that we do it. So we have an assessment schedule, like Jen pointed out, three times a year. So we try to catch kids quickly. And then we make sure that they're getting evidence-based systematic strategies like Brooke talked about. So it isn't just arbitrary or what we're in the mood for, but things that are proven to work. And then we closely monitor those students to see if the intervention is having its intended effect. Um, and we do this in Title I and in other ways. If we're not doing this, we're not fulfilling our professional obligations. I would argue we're not fulfilling our moral obligations to students. So um, and as simple as it sounds, it isn't present in every district that you will go to. So we do have a very robust system of doing this. We're constantly trying to enhance and expand it. And Title I is a critical part of that. So that's why this presentation happens for you every year. Thank you very much, Brooke and Jen. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. I do have one more yes. quick question. Um, in terms of the kids who uh, have not progressed out or have not made enough advancement at the end of sixth grade, is there anything we can do for them in the middle school? Is there any type of program? Yeah, so what we're doing, Hopkins is not at the same place, which you've heard before, not yet at the same place of screening, although this year, um, we're expanding screening, so that same, they'll be using the measured academic progress map testing. They have their screening windows for fall and for winter. They'll identify students and then make determinations about where and how those students get supplemental support if their MAP scores indicate that they are at risk for not meeting grade level benchmarks. And that could happen in, there's an academic support class. I know you're familiar with this, Chris, but for uh, the viewing public, if they're not, there's an academic support class. Um, there have been reading support classes uh, in the past. And sometimes it's just how the teachers within their own classroom might then um, work with students in smaller groups who have similar profiles and needs. But our goal is we have a district goal that will have screening and interventions that are robust and consistent in grades K through eight in math, literacy, and mental health. We're actually moving those out to K through 12. So that is our district goal. And we have made progress and we'll, we're continuing to make progress. The, these tiered systems of support have been in place longer at Hadley Elementary um, and um, and Title I is only, as you point out, it is limited. It's a federal program that's limited to the elementary school. But we are screening at Hopkins this year and determining um, what supplemental intervention students will need and how and when they get those. Like I said, especially with the learning gap due to COVID, we've got some kids that may not have gotten everything they needed and got moved on. And so now they're in a place where Title I doesn't apply. Um, and as an English teacher, you know, my uh, reading fluency just makes everything go better. Every subject becomes easier once we get them up to speed with their reading fluency. So I'm a huge proponent of any type of reading program. Excellent. Thank you. And again, uh, thank you, Annie, Brooke, and Jen. I'm a big fan as well. My kid went through Title I uh, reading programs, uh, started with a lot of tears, and now he no longer cries. So <laughs> thank you so much for all of your efforts. Um, we're going to move next to the wellness policy. Um, and uh, Jen. Actually, I'm, I messed this up. The wellness policy, the policy subcommittee will discuss. So we're good there. Jen doesn't even need to do that. We can go right to the field okay. trip. Is that? So these guys can go, sorry, that was my final Terrific. adjustment. Um, policy mm -hmm. somebody can do that. And the field trip. Uh, Wonderful. Can... Yes, Ruth Ann, tell us about Guatemala. Thank you so much. I know you've got a tight schedule and I really would be happy to give a more thorough presentation at a different date when there's more time. But um, some of you who probably don't even know, but I was 
pre-COVID, we were approved for a trip to Honduras. And then it kept getting pushed and pushed, et cetera. So um, we're scheduled to go now for April of t- this year, uh, or next year, 2023. And um, there were a couple of families who told me they were a little concerned about Honduras um, these days. And as a result, I, I scheduled a meeting with the president of Squads Abroad, the man who owns the company that we go with. And he said there are families all over the place that are concerned about Honduras right now, even though he still maintains that it is a very safe trip and that is their first priority. Um, So, but he did say a lot of schools are changing to Guatemala. And he said, he thinks that that might be a really smart change this year, given um, the conditions, et cetera, and, and the level of safety. And he thinks that families and even the school committee would feel a little bit better about that trip. We, it's still a service trip. Um, this actually, I think, even sounds a little more exciting because it looks like we're going to be working directly in a school. We may be doing some um, building projects, but also um, helping some small construction projects, but just helping with um, some of the in- educational programs in the school. Um, so I'm just actually hoping for approval to make a safer change and go to Guatemala instead of Honduras. Great. Thank you, Ruthann. Looks like a great trip, and I'm really glad you're um, keeping uh, students and families' safety uh, at the front of your mind. Uh, Opening it up to questions or comments from the school committee. Hey, Ruthann. It's Paul. I'm a big supporter of these trips, but just looking at the State Department website, right? I know no place is perfect, um, but there's still... Guatemala has security risks just as much as Honduras or different? I mean, how do you assess the, the difference between security risks and those? Yes, I think it's at the same level, but it's funny because when I was approved, we were at this level as well. Yeah. Um, but Annie and I had been on, the, the. I think what helped us to get a, a approved was Annie and I went on this trip together to it kind of walked through exactly what the students would walk through. Um, and we felt extremely safe. I mean, the squads abroad, that's what they, they're certainly focused on everybody's safety, safety as well. In terms of, and, and it, like you said, it is the same level. For whatever reason, Eric Werner, again, he's the president. He said he thinks people are feeling better about it. I, I actually, he didn't actually say, well, this is why. He said the families are making this change um, to, to Guatemala. And Um, and one thing I would add to that too, Ruthann, so on its face, you're correct. They're both at what's called level three at the State Department. If you read the State Department advisories, actually they list more areas in Guatemala that they recommend that people don't travel to. Squads abroad will never take students or staff to any of the areas that are listed as a do not travel place. Just a reminder, when Ruthann and I went on this trip, there was a police escort from the airport to the place where we were staying. Anytime that there was long travel, there was a police escort and a medical doctor travels with the students the entire time that they're there. I do, I imagine that there is some subjectivity of people's just general feeling of what that might be. But also um, realistically, airfare, it might turn out that the trip is a bit cheaper. Um, Honduras, there aren't as many flights going into Honduras as there are to Guatemala. That doesn't have to do with safety per se, that, that, that added bonus is it's likely that it will be less expensive because the flights will be less expensive. Um, but again, we'll, you know, fully, full, trend, uh, full disclosure, these are, um, which is why they have so many additional measures. When kids go on EF trips, they don't have police escorts, they don't have medical doctors traveling with them. It is a service trip, um, and so to do meaningful service sometimes requires that we go to very, very impoverished countries that, and also consequently, that are slightly, um, have greater political instability. This organization is an excellent organization. It's why Ruthann and I walked through the entire trip, um, but I think they're, we're deferring to Eric's judgment, but there's nothing specific. Like, they do have the exact same level of Uh, risk associated with them on the State Department website. If the entire country were ever a level four, we would not be traveling there. But um, there are regions within every country, same with Mexico, when people travel to Mexico, there are level four regions in Mexico. Uh, We would never be or take kids to a region that was um, designated as level four. Okay, thanks. Good answer, appreciate it. Any other thoughts or comments from the school committee? Do you have enough chaperones? Um, I, I still have to figure out how many students I have yet. Um, but um, I think, yeah, 
Yeah. You're, you're you know, six, each, you, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. We've done so well together before. Yes. <laughs> okay. Very good. Thank you, everyone. This does require, though, we would like a vote to approve okay. location of Guatemala, and then Ruth Ann can begin kind of fundraising. And I think parents would like to know that school committee has approved this location. Do I hear a motion to approve the field trip to Guatemala? So moved. Do I second. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we are moving on to the MTSS SEL presentation. Um, right. Michelle Watteau, it's welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I'll share my screen. I'm appreciative to all of you for allowing me to be here tonight. I'm excited to share with you some of what we accomplished last year and our plans for this year as well. Um, so I believe you uh, received the slides or have access to those as well. And throughout them, there are a number of links uh, where if you're interested at any point, you can see um, there's a lot more information. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to advance. Oh, here we go. Okay, sorry, it didn't work for me initially. Okay, uh, as the social emotional learning and multi-tiered support um, system, systems of support, excuse me, coach. There are three main areas that um, I'm involved with. The first is curriculum implementation, and I include other research based practices there because they're not necessarily always curriculum. Assessment is a big piece of what I do, and teacher support. Teacher support happens through both classroom coaching and professional development sessions. So I'll briefly discuss each of these areas and then later um, touch on how they all work together because. They do just that. What happens in, in one determines and drives the decisions and actions in another of the areas. For curriculum implementation, there were three big areas last year. The first um, is a K through eight social emotional learning curriculum called Fly Five. As part of a grant we, re we received last year, we had a spring pilot where a number of our teachers, so we were pretty excited actually, more even more than we had slotted for. Our kindergarten classroom, a first grade classroom, both second grade, both third grade, both fourth grade, and all of our seventh grade students received between 12 and 16 weeks in a social emotional curriculum. Uh, Fly Five is, created by the Center for Responsive Schools and it features responsive classroom approaches in its lessons. There's also a DEIB component in it. Following that pilot, we surveyed teachers to help us determine if we should move forward with implementing this curriculum as our social emotional learning curriculum, or if we should look into others and it was a unanimous decision. They felt good about, um, about the program, everyone who participated in it, they wanted to give it a full year's try um, and really saw a lot of potential in that. So this year I'm happy to report all K through eight students will receive this curriculum as part of their studies. The second is, is not a curriculum. It is an evidence-based approach to teaching and discipline and that's called responsive classroom. I've shared with you a little bit about that in the past with some of our discussions, but it focuses on four main areas, engaging academics, positive community, effective management and developmental awareness and how these all work together to make the greatest, most positive impacts on our students. I'll talk a little bit about uh, more about responsive classroom too later when I get into teacher supports. The third area with curriculum, again, is not a curriculum, but rather a research-based approach and framework, and that's positive behavior supports. And um, this is a framework for promoting and teaching, reinforcing positive behaviors. Okay. Um, at HES, we had, oh, sorry. At ATS, we had PBIS in place for a number of years prior to COVID. Um, last year, we took a look at what, what had been going well, what we could pick back up as a result of COVID. We weren't able to implement all that we had done prior to COVID because of uh, distancing restrictions and cohorting and all of that. So last year was really about rebuilding and putting back into place initiatives that had gone well prior to COVID and making sure we were implementing those with fidelity and getting new staff trained. 
Similarly, at Hopkins, they had just touched into PBIS prior to COVID. Um, we're ready to launch a framework, um, but we needed to relook at that and how COVID impacted that. So uh, we did more piloting in some of the middle school classrooms in the springtime with a whole class and a grade level incentive program or supports, I should say. And we um, will get more um, into PBIS this year at Hopkins. The second area that's pretty large on involvement is assessment. You heard during the Title I conversation about universal screenings. Prior to COVID, we had universal screenings for literacy in place for all K through 12 students. Um, when it came to math, though, we had that just for third grade and beyond, and we didn't yet have any for mental health screenings. Last year, um, we got back into our practice of using universal screenings and literacy for all of our K through 12 students. And um, excuse me, FastBridge for K through six map for seven through 12. So universal screening literacy, but it's two different types of tests, sorry, depending on the age of the student. For math, similarly, there are two different, we had never before had a screener for K-2 to two students. They participated in math fast bridge for the first time last year, and we re-implemented a three times a year um, universal screening in math for our grade three through 12 students. For mental health, we started, again, as part of a grant um, we piloted in the spring Sabres, which is a universal screening for all K through 12 students. It's a teacher rating scale. Um, and for students to rate themselves, and they're able to do that in grades five through 12. The pilot went really, really well. We have plans to implement this universal screener three times this year, fall, winter, and spring and we'll be determining supports for students who need it based on the information we're getting from these screenings. Okay. For teacher support, the two big areas under that are professional development. There is a series of responsive classroom professional development trainings that I provided to staff at HES last year. Those went really well. Um, I put together something for our new teachers. Uh, new teacher orientation takes place the day before all of the other faculty and staff return at the start of the school year. So I was able to do some work um, on that day with our new faculty. And uh, the, one of the first teacher days back, I also launched helped launch PBIS at Hopkins. Okay, similar to the series I did last year with responsive classroom at the elementary school, I have plans to do six additional ses sessions at Hopkins Academy this year. When it comes to individual teacher support, that could involve classroom coaching. Sometimes that is initiated by the teacher themselves. Sometimes that comes out of a conversation with administration. Uh, there are a number of different teachers who reached out to me last year. I really enjoyed getting into the classroom and helping them. There are also three who um, sought help on their educator evaluation and goal setting and execution chose to include either um, behavior goals or social emotional learning goals as part of their teacher evaluation. So when we talk about supports, what we're aiming for is that at all times in all areas, whether it's academic, social, emotional, or behavior, that 80% of our students or more are meeting the expectations. So when you think at a basic academic, um, as a basic academic example, Grades two student, they hope to be reading 105 words per minute by the end of second grade. Um, similarly, we have behavior expectations. We expect that students at lunch are going to keep their hands to themselves. They're going to use an appropriate volume in their voice, um, use appropriate language, etc. So again, um, when we have systems that work well, 80% or more of our students are meeting expectations. Using that same slide and showing how, uh, how our supports fall into place, you'll see in the green. So this would be supports that all students get. We call those tier one supports or our foundations. 
universal screenings in all areas are happening. We have curriculum that's happening, that's Fly 5. And we also have other or research based practices, responsive classroom and positive behavior supports. When students need additional support, we have things like Math Accelerator for math. We have a variety of different literacy program that really depends on the age level and the reading level of the students. We have social groups when it comes to emotional or behavior supports. And we also would include some individual behavior supports and incentives in here. <clears throat> For a very small percentage of students who fall into what we would call the red area, that's really individualized programming. On the next couple of slides, I have examples of what happens when we don't meet that mark as a large system. I believe it was Christine who asked earlier, um, I believe you asked Brooke, if we saw differences in last year, post-COVID, as we did in our pre-COVID years. We certainly saw that with math. The top, what you're looking at here, um, let me back up. So here's an example of the kind of work that's done when we're not e meeting that 80% goal. The top is our HES, the grades three through six results from the fall math map testing. So this is the universal screener for math. Now, prior to COVID, we had a part-time math coach that met our, that met our needs. Uh, that was sufficient enough. We had 80, we were doing well on MCAS, 80% of our students were meeting grade level expectations. Last year, after our MAP, math fall assessment, you can see this was not happening. Um, we worked together, uh, Annie and I and the other, uh, other members of the administration um, determined that our, our need had gone beyond that of a part-time math tutor. So we, um, created a position, created a schedule, researched programming, got faculty trained, um, hired an interventionist. And by the end of January, we were able to set students up in Math Accelerator, which you might recall from a couple slides ago as one of our tier two interventions. Once we had that intervention, so this was really just a half year, if you take a look at the red and orange, you'll see <laughs> across the board that those, those colors really shrunk. These colors map codes them. Um, they are achievement percentiles nationally, but what I would draw your attention to is the red and orange. For our purposes, we're looking at those students who fall in one of those colors, those would be considered at risk for not passing grade level MCAS standards. So again, when we had a whole system, a, a larger whole school um, support needed, we responded to the data by creating a position, by researching um, different programs and implementing a curriculum that, as you can see, proved effective for our grade three through six students in math. Similarly, when a single child uh, is not meet, when there is a gap between what's occurring in how they're performing in the classroom and what is expected of them, whether it's academically, social, emotionally, or behaviorally, they are referred to the tiered support team. Prior to COVID, we had something called the child study process. Um, we spent a good chunk of the fall last year really working to update and revamp this to reflect what's now required of districts for tiered. And the, the name is just really more appropriate. Child study is a little bit outdated and more of like a track toward or implies a track towards special ed. And um, we really want to stay away from away from that. When a tiered support team, when a student is referred to the tiered support team, um, there's a variety of faculty members, staff members at a meeting. There could be classroom teachers, sometimes special education teachers. Brooke is often at a number of the meetings. There could be adjustment counselor or school psychologist. It's really a problem-solving meeting. And the team um, problem solves in the order of instruction, curriculum, environment, and then the learner. At each of those meetings, an action plan is created. Different members um, are responsible for different pieces of those action plans. And then we meet in a cycle of six to eight weeks. 
So the highlights from last year is that there were 16 students referred to a tiered support team. Of those 16, 13 demonstrated accelerated growth, helped close gaps, whether those were academic, social, emotional, or behavior, and did not need a referral for psychoeducational testing. Um, we had a decrease in undesired behavior in middle school, as reported by the middle school team. There were a number of meetings I met with them in the spring. So, uh, there were also, um, sorry, I regularly surveyed teachers after professional development sessions. So following the start of this school year at Hopkins, um, the we get back to school, the implementing positive behavior supports starting PD that I did with them, 94% of those participants um, responded that they learned skills that can be immediately applied to their classroom or other school environments. Uh, and you heard me mention a couple of times about uh, grant work that we had done last year um, that I, 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 I did some work with Annie on that and um, helped secure a, a good amount of funding for our district and that uh, there's a continuation on that this year. So we're excited. We just got started last year and excited to continue. Um, that's all that I have, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. And like I said, there uh, it's loaded with links too. So at any time, um, if you're curious to learn more or have follow-up questions, if at other times you're searching through anything I've linked in there, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, first of all, thank you yeah. for all of your work across the board. Um, I'm just really pleased to see that our intention uh, is uh, uh, manifested. Um, I also want to commend you on um, bringing in grant dollars to help us continue this work. That's really great. Um, and I do have a, a question about um, strategies that educators are implementing, and it sounds like they're eager and excited to take those on. I wonder, and you don't, don't have to have an answer for this right away, but I wonder if there are um, highlights, um, people that you can sort of lift up for new practices they've implemented as a result of the effort and the training, um, and that might anecdotally help spread um, the uptake on educators being even more interested in some of the strategies and trainings. Uh, so coming off of la last year, um, we had a couple interested in going to the Responsive Classroom Institute as a uh, result of the trainings and a uh, desire to learn more. I believe Karen Sousey at the middle school, um, what the, her schedule allowed for her to participate um, in additional training this summer. I know Shereen St. Peter's was interested, but her schedule unfortunately didn't allow for it. Um, what comes to mind this year quickly again is, is the middle school team. Um, we had our first grade level meeting last Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday, I think it was Thursday. Uh, and they were really pleased at how the start of this year has gone in comparison to last year. Um, you know, last year, notably feeling like students weren't quite ready. You heard Brooke talk about how in first grade, we saw that with reading last year. Similarly, the middle school experienced that um, with behavior, with emotions, with um with uh, social, anything social, <laughs> really, um, and and sort of uh, academic behaviors, we think like learning behaviors, organizational tools, things like that in place. Um, and they all um, had really positive feedback to say what I stressed about uh, to what I tried to stress to them in that first day training was taking a step back from that content that they're so knowledgeable about that they're so passionate about and just taking a step sometimes um, you got to go slow to go fast and really um, drilling in the importance of establishing routines and expectations and how when our beginning of the year nerves and jitters are hitting us hard that Sometimes we don't learn as much as we as as we might. Um, so that was a real highlight for for me too. Um, did that answer your question? Those, those are the couple of people who got really the whole team um, there again at the middle school, and uh, a couple who were eager to 
advance their responsive classroom knowledge that was exciting to see. That's great. And I'll just, uh, you know, add as a note, mm-hmm. Annie, just to keep in the back of our mind how we might lift up and highlight those case stories of um, transformation in teaching and learning mm-hmm. that get different outcomes um, as a means to both educate the um, broader parent community, but also as a, um, a real way to highlight those who are doing uh who are really leaning in to some new tools and practices and uh, serving sort of as a draw for others to think about it as well. Thank you, Michelle, for this great work. Christine. So I've always been a huge fan of responsive classrooms. We've been doing it in the middle school for a really long time. And it, and you're right, it is, it works. A lot of people don't understand that it, you know, because it's pro, it's proactive and it's trying mm-hmm. to, stop behaviors before they become an issue instead of Mm -hmm. reacting. Um, And I think that I know in terms of anything I've been, you know, anyone who's asked me questions, I think that um, your slide presentation was perfect. I think, I hope that's on actually accessible Mm -hmm. for parents to see so that uh, any questions they might have, they can see what it's about because I think the, it's sort of a misnomer to say that it's just social emotional where people don't understand that that, that encompasses behavior, um, discipline, uh, literacy, and, you know, testing in terms of um, where they are in the learning process because usually we find that behavior is connected to whether or not they're be feeling successful in a classroom. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if they're not uh, up to speed and they're not understanding what's being said or read, then that is going to affect behavior. That definitely affects social and emotional learning and that it is all tied together that, that this, the buzzwords, I think, just get people a little, oh, you know, is this about, you know, um, I don't know, safe space and, 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 you know, hug therapy because all they hear is social emotional. They don't realize that that is all part of education and all part of ensuring that they're open to learning the academic part of it. And that it has a lot to do with helping them learn appropriate behaviors so that they can be in a classroom and actually learn the material. Um, so I think that just, you know, uh, I think what, we're doing is great. And I think that there's a lot of schools that, um, you know, don't have what we have. Um, and this is, this is phenomenal, but yeah, I, I just think there was, you know, that what you're doing is so much more than just social, you know, social emotional learning. So I think that, uh, it's great. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. I really appreciate your support and agree with everything you said. (laughs) So thank you again. And thank you, Christine. Also, um, when a when a student is feeling confident or, and, and capable and listening and learning, and the, the, it just really affects the whole, the tenor of the whole classroom experience. Right? They're not mm-hmm. no no one's operating in a vacuum. It really just affects the whole classroom. And so, um, it's it's uh, uh, very much uh, needed. And you are absolutely right. Um, we, we are a little bit on the um, uh, cutting edge of doing the right things. So pretty great. Other uh, school committee members, comments, questions? Um, I wanted to tack on. I, I think it's a great idea what Christine said. You know, I did to back up to, um, I was really excited when this role um, came to us. And then I was even more excited that Michelle was going to be placed in that role. I think she's um, a fantastic teacher and a very enthusiastic person um, and, and just a great fit for the role. The only thing I'm sad about is she's not, she's not teaching her students anyway. It's the only downfall I can see. Um, but I, I really, I, I, I really like Christine's idea of making sure these slides are available, but even, you know, take it a, take it a step further with, with Annie, your superintendent letter and kind of doing like a highlight, like you started me thinking, Christine, you know, do parents really understand 
um, what this means. Do they understand kind of a lot of parents know Michelle, do they really understand what she's transitioned into? And I, I think you sent out an email last year, Michelle, but I, you know, I think it's good as a refresher too to give like a little blurb about Michelle, maybe even with a picture, um, with a brief like description of, of, of what it means to be in your role and then attaching the slides, like just a little blurb about what it is you do. I just think it would be a great thing to do. I, I kind of like that idea too, of kind of highlighting some of our staff anyways, just so you can, and I like the idea of pictures too. For instance, I had no idea that that was Brooke and that role. And I would see her every day and every day I wanted to say, where do you work? But I didn't want to be rude, like out my window waving to her. Um, so, you know, there's just a lot of people in the building that do these fabulous, really important things that a lot of parents that don't have any personal experience with them might not, might not know, right. What their role is and, 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 and how vital it is. So I kind of like the idea of just like a staff highlight in the superintendent letter and maybe start, start with Michelle's at the forefront, you know, what we have to offer, what we can, you know, what these people are what these people are doing and how it's beneficial. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Yeah. Paul. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Michelle. Really appreciate the update. I'm glad we're continuing on with the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks, Thanks Michelle. Okay. Thank you. Annie, I believe yeah. you're up next. Yes. I'm not going to share my slides. They are linked into the agenda. I just want to touch base. So this theme again is how do we, I, how do we make sure that we identify students who may need or require supplemental evidence-based interventions and instructions in order to meet grade level expectations. Title three refer, refers to our English, English, uh, as a second language program or what we do for English language learners. And the way we find English language learners in our district is the same way that every district does in the Commonwealth. Anytime a student enrolls, any student enrolls in our district, <coughs> excuse me, they need to complete a home language survey. If on that survey, the families indicate that a language other than English is spoken in the home, those children are automatically screened. And if they score in a certain range, they're then offered English as a second language with our certified ESL teachers. Families always have the option of opting out of ESL instruction. They are not required to participate. It's rare that families do, but occasionally they do opt out of ESL instruction. And then once a student, these students are assessed every year in addition to taking MCAS, not in their first year in the country, but um, in years two and going forward. In addition to taking MCAS, they also take another standardized test that solely focus on, focuses on their language proficiency. It assesses their language proficiency, their expressive language, speaking and writing, and their receptive language, reading and listening. And they also get an overall score and an overall literacy score. Once students meet certain thresholds, it happens to be a 4.2, the highest score is a six. 4.2 overall and a composite literacy of 3.9 on this test, they can then exit out. Before they exit out of ESL, our staff members come together led by the ESL teacher. They come together as a team. Sometimes we'll recommend continuing services for students. That's happened. If we notice that for, with all the other screenings we've talked to you about tonight, that if we notice that students, that, that progress on the access score doesn't seem to be indicative of their overall academic performance. We think long and hard before we take away any support from a student. Um, what's interesting is that overall, we had a peak in our, in our English language learner population, I wanna say about, let's say about six or five years ago. If I've been here nine years, say roughly, about five years ago, where we had almost 30 English language learners in the district. Now that number is down to 14. I'm not exactly sure what we would attribute that to, that we have fewer um, recently arriving uh, immigrants and speakers of other languages, um, perhaps living in Hadley, 
or living long-term in Hadley. We do have students come through the system and uh, we have had families that then move out of Hadley. Um, but it is curious that it has uh, dipped dramatically. Right now, as of today, we have 14 students who qualify for English ESL instruction. We're still screening kindergarten students right now. But currently we have um, 14 in grades one through 12, seven at HES and seven at HA. And again, we have several kindergarten students that we're screening. Um, so in the spring of 2022, it's actually late winter, we tested 16 students. Um, 15 of those students were included. The state sets a progress target for students. So the student who wasn't included means they didn't have a progress target because they probably were a new arrival. So they didn't have any, they hadn't tested before. 40% of students met the progress targets. So progress target is what the state says. They say, we think that you should, if you scored 1.6 overall on access, we think next year you should score a 2.4. That's a progress target. Now, more students had moderate to very high growth. We saw a couple of students whose growth percentiles on access were 90%, 78 SGP. So very high, very aggressive growth. The historical data on students meeting progress targets. So this is that question of, have we seen anything different with COVID? And I would say yes, because historically it hovers around 50%. So in 2021, 53% of students met those targets. In, um, uh, and, and this year we saw this dip in 2022 to 40. Now it would seem like, well, wait a minute, that doesn't totally make sense, right? Wouldn't we have seen that dip more in 21 than we would in 22? And I, I can't tell you why, but um, that 21-22 school year was, it was hard across the board. I mean, we saw dips and you'll see also, I, I probably took it off the agenda. Hopefully I did. We're not going to talk about it because the MCAS scores are still embargoed probably an adjustment I'm referring to now. I did take it off. Oh no, maybe I didn't. Um, they're still embargoed. So we'll talk about them in October. But, you know, spoiler alert, um, they're statewide. We saw dips in MCAS. We, as, as Brooke talked about, we saw a greater need right after COVID um, with students in reading. We saw some definite social and emotional needs last year, significant. And then we saw this dip in access. Um, we do have students lined up and they're being screened now and we'll make sure they get the supports that they need. I just wanted to bring you up to speed on the data. Again, what's important for the school committee and the public to know is that this isn't just we look at the data and then we file it away. Um, we look at this routinely. So at every screening, when all that screening data comes out, we'll look back at access. We'll look at any what's called early warning indicator system data that the state has. And we say, okay, is there anybody who's identified as being at risk of not meeting grade level benchmarks, is there any student for whom that's been, who's been identified that we don't have supplemental supports set up for that student? So we make sure as grade level teams, as a district leadership team, we go down that list of every single student and we can name this, the interventions that they're receiving, the supplemental supports and how the effect is being tracked. So. Hopefully next year we'll see greater growth. And that's your Title I update. Great, thank you, Annie. Um, questions from the school committee, Christine. So um, I, I'm just wondering if you could address this because I'm wondering if people listening to this are gonna say, okay, so if they're doing all this screening, when are they gonna actually do schoolwork? Um, and just address whether, you know, how much time it really does take up, um, just because I yeah. think anyone listening to it might be thinking, yeah, okay, but what is this all going to do for all the kids? Yeah. In terms of the amount of screen. Right. That's a great question. Thank you for asking that question, uh, Christine, because I forget. We get so entrenched in this. We think the whole world is doing it. So one of the reasons that we we in literacy that we moved away from Dibbles, Paul's favorite acronym always, to FAST is that acronym is it is really fast. So it actually it's quite quick. It's, it's uh, computerized, the teachers are well trained, and we also bring in. So for this year, we bring in graduate students in the school psychology uh, program at UMass, 
and they come in and they assist with the screening. So we get it done very efficiently. The results, which makes it so much better than MCAS and some of these larger standardized measures, mm -hmm. the results are there immediately. Right. And then we bring the teachers together and they can immediately identify it's color coded, what the benchmarks were, who didn't meet them. And they can set up those supplemental instructional groups in no time at all. In, in one, just a, you know, a short period of time, they have their groups, they have their interventions, and the students then see the intervention specialist. The actual screening itself, when we're talking about things like FAST and MAP, they're very short windows, and they're very um, efficient. And really, what it's about is getting us the data that we need as quickly as possible um, so that we can do, as you're referring to, the real work of making sure that instruction is matched to the student's need. And that's on both ends of the continuum, right? Mm -hmm. So when we see kids who are doing very well, the screening says that these are students who are just performing at very high levels, we want to make sure that they're being stretched, right? We right. just don't want to hope for the best, teach to the middle, and hope people don't get frustrated and bored. Mm -hmm. So it is, I mean, I didn't give you an exact amount of time, so I probably misquote it, but it is called fast for a reason. And even the map testing, we're very efficient at this now and using the mm -hmm. data. So it, it doesn't, it takes less time than MCAS takes us. MCAS is much more of an event. Right. But thank you for asking that. Great. Thank you, Christine. Any other thoughts or comments about this? Hey, and are you all sufficiently staffed to meet this increased need? Well, I, I believe that we are because, um, so we have more needs, but you saw like the, the English language learner population is on the decline right now. So um, we have fewer students in that population who are trying to meet. We have specifically used some of our funding, like ESSER funding for Michelle's role that helps, helps greatly in terms of meeting the, helping us do the mental health screening, helping teachers come up with interventions around behavior, proactive interventions around behavior. And um, we are looking to, we, we had a little bit of some staffing hiccups at the start of the year. I believe everybody is aware that we had a late summer resignation and we had to kind of shuffle staff a little bit. We do have a qualified and certified teacher in every single room. It looks like, you know, we're still looking for a, a long-term permanent solution. Um, and it looks like we may be close to landing on one. So once that happens, um, HES will be in a better position to get its um, supplemental programs going in in literacy. So right now we're a little stressed, but there's less to do with that has more to do with trying to respond to this late summer resignation in a critical subject area. Thanks. Dean. I just want to, this is more of a curiosity Mm -hmm. um, only because I was reading something and it made me think of this. Um, with our ELL students <laughs> and everything that goes along, you know, goes on, goes along with the COVID issue of a lot, they're seeing that there's a lot of backslide uh, due to the fact that in the home they may not be speaking, that they weren't speaking English at all during that time, except possibly to their friends. Um, so they weren't getting instruction uh as much is there is there any way that we can that we go back and you know check to see if some of these ELL students are still progressing if they're no longer getting services does that make am I it making does. sense so two things one thank you for bringing that up so I think that bit of like huh wouldn't we have seen more of decline like why do we still see this in 22 to your point that even though students may have been coming to school, there was still a lot less socializing that was happening, right. which is really critical when you're talking about second language acquisition, right? That's where a lot mm -hmm. of that happens. Your other question though, thank you for asking that. So by law, we have to monitor for three years. So we do, they're called L's and L's. So former English language learners. So we monitor and they're on monitoring plans for three years and we're required to do that. Um, and if we see anything that's concerning, we can re-refer back to ESL. So we do. And then we do have to track by law ever L. So if you ever receive services, but we do closely monitor for a minimum of three years. 
Great. Great. Any other questions for Annie? Thank you, okay. Annie. Guys. Appreciate your work on this. Okay, um, we have some, uh, we're, we're done with the agenda items, I believe. We do have some policies to discuss. We'll get to that in a minute. We are skipping over the business manager report. Nothing to report mm -hmm. this month. We'll come back to that next month. So school committee reports and discussions, um, finance, I can report that there hasn't been a tri-board meeting. Um, and I do not believe there's been one scheduled yet. I keep continue to uh, keep my eyes peeled for that. Uh, CES, Kruger. Those meetings start up again next week on Wednesday. It got pushed from this Wednesday to next. So next meeting, I'll have an update. Terrific. Thank you. Um, policy, Ethan. Are we, is this where we're discussing the policies or are we going to talk about that later? No, this will be fine to do that. That's okay with you, Humera, to get, yes. we need to vote on fuel efficiency and the first read on wellness. So I guess we can start with the wellness um, policy, the updated policy, and I, I will probably not do uh, Jen uh, justice uh, by trying to share out uh, all of the updates. And Christine, please come in behind me. But um, we, we looked over the first draft of the updated wellness program, the policy. Um, a lot of, um, it, it felt like you guys were kind of coming of age, like getting all of the new people on board, new policies in place, kind of looking at what had been done in the past um, and updating it um, for where we are now. Um, again, Jen did a much better job of explaining it all earlier. Um, if there's anything I, if there's anything you want to specifically point out, please do. Or Christine, if there's anything you want to specifically point out. Yeah, uh, Jen's still here, so I'll leave that up to her if she thinks there's anything we need to highlight. Uh, you all received a copy of it. Um, I presented earlier at subcommittee and really it's just adjustment of, and Ethan's absolutely right. It's uh, just reconvening the team, looking at our current policy, strengthening what we had, putting some new um, names on, on it and within it. Um, it was a collaborative effort um, again, with many different parties. Um, and we will be continuing to work on our wellness policy together as a team. We'll be meeting throughout the school year. We have um, some new new folks, and I'd love to see some strengthened um, kind of, it, we haven't gotten together as, as a group in a really long time. So I'm looking forward to partnering with Hopkins Academy um, to really just make sure that our, our wellness policy is strong and that we have everybody at the table to make decisions that are in the best interests of the wellness, um, both physically and socially, emotionally for our students. And, and is it is it new that uh, you have parent and student representatives on this? Was that always the case or is that a new development? We've always had that, Ethan. Um, we've always had that, although, you know, with COVID, um, some of these have kind of fallen by the wayside and our, our direction has been um, kind of pulled in, in different directions. Um, so I'm excited to meet some Hopkins students that are, are excited about doing some, some great things with us um, around our wellness policy. We have a new athletic director. We have a new food service director. Um, we have a, a new nurse at Hopkins. And so we're excited to bring these people along and, and really meet together as a team. Um, but we've always had this. It's just the work has, has brought us in different directions. And so it's just refocusing um, and strengthening our wellness policy. And again, is that, a, is that gonna be accessible once we come up with the final draft or we vote on the final draft? Um, is that gonna be up on the website for parents to view? And yes, yes once, once, it's, um, once it's approved, um, and then we will, of course, put it on the website. We will share it out so folks have access to it. And again, I'm always looking for parent feedback. I'm always looking for community engagement around all of our, all of our policies and everything that happens um, at Hadley Elementary School and I know at Hopkins as well. So um, I love sharing out information to get that feedback and we will be doing that. Great. Um, thank you, policy committee members and Jen Dowd. I, I did a quick scan of it and it's really comprehensive, covers so mm -hmm. many different areas. And I'm really excited to see it uh, uh, 
come up for policy review. So thank you. So it, at this time, we don't need to vote. It is first reading. Correct. However, they will now present to you the fuel efficiency policy, which does require yes. a vote. Great. Yes, and this is the, the final reading. And this, uh, again, we had the the school school's attorney kind of go through and, and make most of the changes on this. And this is meant to reflect um, this policy being a school policy and not a municipal policy of the town. So when you see the changes, though, that's really what the changes reflect. Again, there's been some talk about school buses. They are exempt from this policy, I believe. Um, and so we don't have to worry about that. Okay, um, so let me just clarify that what we're looking at as a whole is a, is a document that begins town of Hadley fuel efficient vehicle policy. And that is the policy you're asking us to pass. Mm -hmm. Correct, yes. Okay, terrific. Um, any other thoughts or questions about this, Paul, Tara? I just, just for my clarification, I was looking through that fuel efficiency policy and it doesn't say what the fuel efficiency standard is, it, it, but it refers to a criterion four with the state. Is that what that is? I didn't have a time to look it up. Normally when you see a fuel efficiency standard, you, you know, it's miles per gallon of something. Yeah. Um, so yes, it is um, uh, the criterion four for updates before ordering. So the criterion four, they, the expectation is that you, before ordering any vehicle, you have yeah. to then refer to, in case those are changed, right? So it's not listed in the policy, but you have to make sure that you meet the criterion for updates prior to ordering any replacement vehicles. And that's a policy set by the state. Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, and uh, this is a policy that we are passing, um, or move it, moving towards, uh, to, to passage. Do I hear a motion to approve this policy? So moved. Do I hear a second? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. All right. Um, thank you, policy committee. Um, moving on to finance, capital, sorry, capital, Paul. Well, our big thing is we have a the CPA meeting in 13 minutes to talk about our proposal for phase two of the fields. So, Great. Well, yeah. Good luck. And now we've got the revised number to, to present to them. Excellent. You're and, on mute, Annie. Uh, so I know you're going to do your best on Wednesday, uh, but do we want to have a backup for policy, uh, excuse me, for capital at 530 or are you feeling pretty good that you... Yeah, that's a good point. So I'm on travel. I'm in Houston. And there's a cap, uh, capital planning committee meeting oh. at 530 on um, Wednesday. I think I can make it. Um, but if, if I can't, is there anybody who could sit in? I think, what, are we presenting the whole shebang, Annie? The, well, uh, actually, so the, that group is the group that expects a school committee, one representative from the school committee at a minimum, to be there and review all of the policy requests and then decide as one of the voting members, decide which ones to advance. So it isn't just ours. There are some from DPW, there are some from police, there are some from everybody. Okay. And then, so from ours, it would be from that spreadsheet. It's all of those. Correct. So it's actually this year, it's the ceiling tiles and the, the only thing we're asking town capital for right. aside from CPA, ceiling tiles and um, fire alarms. Yeah. How about this? I should know more about my schedule tomorrow so I can text folks and see. But um, Perfect. I'm always around if need be. Great I, I can, Thanks, I can be available. Is this on Zoom or is this in person? Zoom. Zoom. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Christine. You're welcome. Okay. Terrific. Um, moving on. Negotiations. Christine. So we, we had our first meeting. We essentially just went over the ground rules and um, we'll have our next meeting. Annie, I don't have my book in front of me. Right, I don't have my date book. It's, it's, uh, it's 
this month. No, it's next month. I don't have the date. Right. Time. Okay. <laughs> Not in front of me. Sorry. So we do have uh, two other meetings scheduled. Yes. Yes. So it was just basically introductions and then we'll go from there. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, okay. We are um, on to announcements. Um, our select board liaison, Joyce Chunglo, is not here. Um, she did have a prior engagement. And I just want to call the attention to folks next week, the 20th, is our first day of that single tier where Hopkins Academy will have a delayed start and Hadley Elementary will have an early release. And folks will re receive um, detailed bus information at the end of this week and our principals will also remind their families, but I just wanted to remind everyone. Oh, Annie, you're on mute now. You one day next week, yes, one day next week, the 20th. Terrific, thank you. Um, I also want to announce again that we are having um, another uh, community world's fair, this time at the library. There'll be lots of international food. It's September 23rd from five to seven. And you can find out more information about it at Hadley Learns in the events section. Um, okay, I think that brings us to the end. Let's see, we have to approve the minutes for August 22nd. Do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. So, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, approval of executive session minutes for August 22nd. Do I hear? I don't have those. Actually, I don't have those linked in there. So I can bring this back to the next meeting. I don't have those linked here. I don't think. And I, did you receive them? Did you guys receive them with the regular minutes? I'm just afraid you didn't. Let me bring this. Yeah. Let me bring this back. If that's okay. Let me bring these back and I'll make sure they're linked in. So it's fine that the first one A is approved, but I'll bring to I'll bring this to October. Great. Thank you, Annie. Sure. Uh, approval of the warrants, August 2022. Do I so hear a motion to approve that? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, we have already approved the fuel efficiency policy yeah. and the trip to Guatemala. Our next meeting date is October 24th. Annie, that's at 5.30 p.m.? Correct. And will there be a policy subcommittee meeting on that day? Yes, prior to it at 4.30. Okay, wonderful. And we are convening into executive- We don't need to, I'm sorry. I should have told you that. You're good. You guys are all done. You don't need to go into executive session. Wonderful. Okay, do I hear a motion to adjourn this meeting? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Terrific.